Turn together to Psalm 90 in the Old Testament. Uh, the book of Psalms, Psalm 90 uh, this morning. If we were to be honest this morning, just as completely honest as we can possibly be, we would have to admit that there are some biblical concepts that we just have trouble wrapping our minds around. Certain things we get and we understand and we appreciate, you know, we think of the love of God for us, uh, it's hard to understand the depth of that, but we understand the concept because we have loved other people and had other people love us, so we have uh, a frame of reference for that. But there are certain concepts that are just a challenge for us to wrap our minds around. One of those is the concept that we serve an eternal God. A God that, that spans all of time, past, present, and future. It's a concept that we really have trouble just in general wrapping our minds around it and really grasping what it means. We're so bound by time, and everything in our lives is structured around time and uh, events that it's hard for us to think beyond that. I mean, if you just think about the things that we call timeless... You know, you hear certain songs and people describe those songs as timeless. And what that means is it was written 50 years ago. Oh, or uh, some uh, artwork or, or uh, you know, something like that that we describe as timeless that may date back a few hundred years or, or something of that nature. And we, we think of it uh, in those terms. But here's uh, a concept that becomes Almost one of those that, uh, that is so overwhelming to our minds that we almost just discount it and write it off and say, let's just move on to something else, because this is so beyond my mind's capacity to understand. But I want us to take up uh, the subject anyway this morning and look at what it means to know our God is an eternal God, to speak of Him in terms of eternity. And here's what I know. Anytime you use the words eternity and sermon in the same sentence, uh, that people begin to get worried uh, a little bit. Uh, but hopefully we can take up the topic uh, without it being our experience uh, this morning. The fact is, most of us, our concept of time starts with our own birth. So if I were to tell you that I was born in 1969... To some of you, that will sound like ancient history. To others of you, you think, well, that's not all that long ago. I remember that real well. Uh, it's all a matter of when time really started for us. When did our time on this earth start? Think about it. When we talk about the, the birth of our nation in a history class or somewhere where you studied it, and think about the birth of the Roman Empire, in our minds, both of those are just way back there somewhere. But the truth is they're separated by 2,000 years. And it's difficult for us to grasp that gap. Well, we're bound by time, yet we have a very narrow understanding of it. So it's almost unfathomable for us to approach this topic and learn God is above and beyond time. That we're bound by time, but He's not. He sees the Roman Empire. He sees the birth of America. He sees today. He sees a thousand years from now at the same time. In an instant, uh, He is God over all of that. He has no beginning, no end. And he operates completely outside of time. That's why uh, when you start in Genesis 1-1, and the Bible says simply, in the beginning, God created. Now let me give you a, a philosophical statement that I hope doesn't mess you up too much this morning, but it's one we have to understand. If there was no something before there was something, there would be nothing. There had to be someone, something before there was anything, or else there would be nothing. And we could spend our entire lives just contemplating that philosophically. But the implications of an eternal God involved with us are so powerful, so overwhelming, that I think we need to, to focus on exactly what that means. In the series of messages that we're in entitled Knowing Where to Turn, what we're doing is looking at 
the characteristics, the attributes of who God is and understanding what that means for us. So that when we get into the, the struggles of life, in whatever form they may take, we understand the right place to go with those concerns. And if God is beyond time, then that begins to tell us that He is always available and present for us. That there is never a moment where He's caught off guard. There's never a moment where we can't access Him and reach Him and draw near to Him. And so what I want to do is attempt this morning to take something so vast and so grand and so beyond our capacity to fully understand and take it and put it down on, if you will, the bottom shelf and think about what does the eternality of God mean for you and for me in a practical sense? What difference does that make? How does that impact my life to understand that concept? Listen, what we'll begin to discover is that there is never a moment when we're alone. There is never a moment when we're without help. And there is never a moment when we're waiting on God to arrive. And in Psalm 90, this is a psalm that goes back to the days of Moses. And in the first two verses that we're going to look at this morning, I think we'll begin to discover what it means to know a God who is always there. Psalm 90, verses 1 and 2, the Bible says this, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were born... Or you gave birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Those are pretty profound words when you stop and just reflect on them in that way. You see, when you discuss the, the character, the attributes of God, this one attribute of God touches all of them. Think about it. We often describe God as being a loving God. But when you understand that God is also eternal in nature, that means God loves us eternally. So when we come to a passage of Scripture where the Bible says, I have loved you with an everlasting love, we're taking that concept and making it practical. That God is loving We think about God's holiness and God's justice and God's righteousness. God always has been and always will be holy and just and righteous. That there is never a time when, even though the standards in the world may change, even though the culture may change, even though society may change its opinions, God's holiness and righteous and justice never changes. We think about the sovereignty of God, that He is over all, that He is all-powerful, that He is in control of all things. That has always been the case. Before there was anything, God was in control. God was the author of all things. God remains in control, even though we mess up, even though we have fallen. And even though we don't know what the future holds, we can know that God remains in control. And so this is an important attribute of understanding who God is. Knowing that God is always there. What does that mean? Well, again, I want to take it and make it as as simple and as practical as possible for us this morning. And hopefully this will be an encouragement and a help to us as we go through life. So let me give you a few statements out of this. And let's break down this passage and see what God has to say to us this morning. Knowing God is always there for me means, first of all, that I'm able to trust God at all times. That there is never a situation, never an experience where I can't trust Him. One of the most basic questions that we ask of anybody when we are getting to know them or seeking to connect with them is, can I trust you? Now, are you the kind of person, we may not ask it, but that's what we're thinking in our minds. Are this, is this person trustworthy? Can I really rely on them? And you think about how many institutions or individuals that we've placed our trust in that have failed us through the years. You think about how in our culture we've tried to trust our government. And then you have issues like Watergate and many other scandals that we could probably uh, list off and how uh, it's proven itself to be less than trustworthy at times. Uh, We've thought that we could trust in business. And we've seen failure after failure and scandal after scandal in the business world. 
Uh, we, we thought that we could trust in, in even religion and the church. And we've seen scandals like the scandal in the Catholic Church with the priesthood. We've seen the Jimmy Swaggerts and the Jim Bakers of the world. Uh, we've seen all of the false teachers that rise up and gain notoriety of, only to be exposed for the falsehood that characterizes their message. But the thing that we have to understand is that God is proven. His trustworthiness has stood the test of time. So in verse 1, the Bible says, You have been our dwelling place in all generations. And this was spoken of that time when Israel was wandering in the wilderness after slavery. And God was their strength and their portion. He would guide them uh, with a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. He would provide manna for them. He would provide water from a rock uh, for them. God constantly provided for His people. He was their, uh, their source and their strength. He was their dwelling place in all generations. And it all started uh, by God dispatching Moses. You remember how in Exodus God came to Moses and said, I want you to go to Egypt, to Pharaoh. I want you to stand before him and say, enough. And Moses rightly said, you know what, God, I'm not anybody. So by what authority can I do this? And God answered him. And in Exodus 3, 14, the Bible says there, uh, God said, uh, you go uh, and, and tell them, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Isn't that important uh, to, to grasp that God said, Moses, I want you to go, but I'm not depending on you at all. It's all about me. It doesn't matter who you are. It matters who I am. I'm the one that's trustworthy. If God is eternal in nature, uh, then He is able to act. He is able to, to operate despite what we may think or, or what obstacles stand in our way. And every generation has found God to be the same. God is present, God is in control, and God is completely reliable. Boy, in my own uh, personal study time of late, uh, I've been studying through the book of Nehemiah, and I came again this week uh, just for several days and just kind of camped out in Nehemiah chapter 9. And I would encourage you, if you ever want to, uh, to go study something that will bless you, go to Nehemiah 9. Because Nehemiah has just gathered the people all together, the people of Jerusalem. Remember the, the walls of Jerusalem were broken down, and they were vulnerable and the people had been scattered and taken into captivity, and all the people were just demoralized. And what people had returned uh, had just lost their faith, lost their hope, and they were just kind of living a, a miserable existence. And God raised up Nehemiah to return to Jerusalem, and in a period of just a handful of weeks, were able to rebuild the walls of the city, to restore its strength and its confidence and its ability to withstand all of its enemies that were around it. But the one thing that was still yet to be restored was an understanding of God's law, God's Word. There were generations that had never heard the law. And so Nehemiah went to Ezra and the other priests, and he brought them in and said, I want you to read it to teach from it. And the Bible says for days they built what essentially is like what we have here. They built a platform for them to stand on and to speak to the people the truth of God's Word. And the people were so struck by it. They'd never heard these things. They knew uh, kind of historically about where they came from, but they didn't know the truth. And the truth began to change their lives. And Nehemiah recounted for them all of the ways that God had been there for them and how He had continued to guide them and provide for them. And even when they had sinned, even when they had fallen, God was there to hear them and to restore them. And then they would start rocking rightly again until another obstacle came and they would stumble and fall. And God was faithful and when they would repent, He would lift them up and rescue them from their, from their captivity. Uh, from the sin uh, that had so uh, 
demoralized and destroyed them, and He would restore them yet again. And it was just a, a yet another reminder of how God is a constant. He is always there. No matter what failure we go through or what obstacle we face, God is there. Our God is ageless. It is the principle that Nehemiah understood, that Moses understood here. And listen, that means that God never needs to mature or to develop. Uh, he possesses everything perfectly right now and always. God's perspective never changes. Isn't that amazing to think about? Our perspective changes all the time. You know how we talk about, well, when you get older, you'll understand. Well, when you go through something like this, it'll make more sense to you. God's perspective never changes. He understands everything fully right now. Because He's in charge of it all. He stands the test of time. Boy, we fear the future if we're not careful. Boy, we, we look at it and we worry about what's coming. Or we regret the past. Or we struggle in the present. But God is always right now in all three. And that's, again, difficult. We think, well, what's past it, it's gone, it's back there. Listen, God is there. God is here. God is out there. He stands beyond all of it. And that means that I can trust Him with what I'm going through. When you begin to think of it in those terms, then my worry about what's coming this week sounds kind of silly, doesn't it? What I've got to face tomorrow, what I've got to do next week, all those things begin to, to really be put in their proper perspective in, in the light of the fact that we serve a God who understands all of it and who's already there and who has been a constant throughout all generations. And it's essential uh, to know uh, that God's in control. Uh, because that means if, if God realizes that we need to know the exact plan ahead of time, He'll tell us. If we need to know it, God will reveal it to us. Otherwise, when we have decisions to make, we make those decisions on biblical principles. We trust God is already in the future and will continue to be our dwelling place. See, the unexpected that comes into our lives, it kind, of, it kind of paralyzes us or creates fear and anxiety within us. But God's in control. God is there. And if we trust Him, then we can move forward in confidence. But knowing God is always there also means uh, that I am unable to escape His authority as much as my flesh may want to. Well, we like to be in control. That's a product of a sinful, fallen nature. That, that's uh, really the, the origin of it. I want to call the shots in my life. But the fact that God is eternal means that, uh, that He's unaffected by time, and therefore His control has never been diminished. Look at verse 2. Before the mountains were born, or you gave birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. From eternity past to eternity future, He is God. He's in control. There is never a time when God says, John, why don't you take the reins of your life for now? God's in control. There is never a moment when He comes to you and says, ah, it's okay if you call the shots on this one. God is in control. Even though we try. And we live in an arrogant world today that dislikes God's Word, that rejects His ways, and the result is that we ignore Him and we wait Him out uh, and we try to use science to, to explain Him away. But it doesn't change the fact that from everlasting to everlasting, He is God. Uh, this is especially important, I believe, in our world today when we look at how uh, so much of our culture is trying to redefine morality and what it means to, to be a, a good person. Listen, we don't have that authority. From everlasting to everlasting, He is God. 
So when you run up across somebody that says, well, you know, times have changed, thinking has changed, people have changed. That's all true. But you know what hasn't changed? God. God hasn't changed. And if He hasn't changed, then His standard doesn't change. His holiness doesn't change. His Word doesn't change. That's the real issue. And it's amazing to me that we live in a world where we think we can vote ourselves the authority. Well, I didn't know if I was going to share this or not, but I really feel the need to. In my home state of Alabama, they've got an election going on for senator in that state. And I'm not endorsing a candidate, but I'm going to tell you something. Morality matters. And I don't care what party you're in. If you are guilty of doing immoral things, then you shouldn't be in office. It's as simple as that. And it's amazing to me the number of so-called Christians that are trying to explain away things that we would not tolerate within our own homes. And yet we're going to put somebody in power. It's unfathomable. What it is is an affront to God and to His authority. If we believe that God is eternal, we believe His Word, then His Word stands for all of eternity. Isn't that what He said in Isaiah? The grass withers, the flower fades away, but the Word of God stands forever. It doesn't change. Isaiah 43, 13 says, Even from eternity I am He, and there is none who can deliver out of my hand. I act, and who can reverse it? The attempt is to try to understand and define God in, in today's world as limited and finite in some way. But an eternal God outlasts all of our thinking, all of our ways, all of our philosophies. God's not going to die. And even if we ignore Him on earth, we will reckon with Him in the life to come. You know, mankind thinks that I can do whatever I want and then death is the end. But I got news for you. God will still be there. That's the reality we have to understand. So knowing that God is always there means that I am forever under His authority. But you know what? That's why it's important to know that He has loved us with an everlasting love. That He is a gracious and merciful and forgiving God. Because we're not forever under a standard of judgment. We are forever under the invitation to grace and forgiveness and hope and love. That's the message of the gospel. But thirdly, knowing that God is always there means personally then that I am tied to God's unfolding plan in this world. It's still being played out, and I'm a part of that. And since He's eternal, and He created everything that is, by definition, all that goes on is part of His plan. And as His created beings, then we are a part of it as well. Well, this is not in the, uh, the sermon slides or anything, but I want you to go to the book of Isaiah, to chapter 40. This is one of my favorite passages in all the Bible to really understand the nature of God. Isaiah chapter 40. I'll give you the time to turn there because I want you to see it, and it's not going to be on the screen. You want to know about the greatness of God? You want to spend time dwelling on that and meditating on that? Go to Isaiah chapter 40 in your own personal study time, and just let the richness of all this uh, sink in and try to, uh, to contemplate all this. Down in verse 12, we think about the eternality of God. Listen to this. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of His hand or marked off the heavens by the span and calculated the dust of the earth by the measure and weighed the mountains in a balance and the hills in a pair of scales? Who has directed the Spirit of the Lord or as his counselor has informed him? With whom did he consult, and who gave him understanding? 
And who taught him in the path of justice and taught him knowledge and informed him in the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket and are regarded as a speck of dust on the scales. Behold, he lifts up the islands like fine dust. Even Lebanon is not enough to burn, nor its beasts enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are regarded by him as less than nothing and meaningless. All those great empires, all of man's great accomplishments and great kingdoms and great advancements and great power and military might and political strength and ability to dominate other people, all of that God looks at and says, it's nothing compared to me. We serve a great God. And all of this is a part of his plan. We look at it and think, wow, things are out of control. What's going on in North Korea? What's going on in the Middle East? What's going on in China or Russia or in the United States or other places around the world? And we think everything is out of control. And God says it's just a speck of dust compared to who I am. I am the author of all of this. And it's not uncommon for us to, to read a passage like that and immediately come to the question, well then, does my life have any meaning? If this is how God regards it, do, do I have any meaning? Well, uh, the simple answer that I would give you is the only meaning we will ever find is in relation to that eternal God. That's where meaning comes from, in who He is and what He does. As He said, in Revelation 1, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. The God whose plan was displayed in Noah's obedience and in Moses' leadership and in David's reign and Isaiah's prophecy and Paul's ministry is the same God who weaves our lives into that same plan. We're a part of that. A part of God's plan of redemption in this world. As an eternal God, He is uninterrupted by anything within the sphere of time. You ever find yourself when we are hit with tragic events like what took place just a week ago in Texas? Thinking, well, when's the next event like that going to happen? When's the next random, tragic event going to take place? Well, we wouldn't be human without saying uh, that we're just kind of caught with that, you know, after Las Vegas and then in Texas, and what's the next one that's going to happen? What's the next cataclysmic event that the world's going to face? And we can get overwhelmed by that until we realize that none of that is random in the eyes of God. It's a product of living in a sinful, fallen world. People say all the time, how could a loving God let something like that happen? Folks, the right response to that is, were it not for the love and the grace of God, things like that would happen every single moment of every single day. It's the grace of God that allows us to have good days and blessed experience through life. And is it tragic? Absolutely. Do we weep and mourn for those that are hurting? Yes, we do. It broke my heart to watch all of that unfold. And it is so horrendous, but that's when our faith is proven in those moments that we trust God. Listen, if you were to sit down to write a novel, as the author of it, you have the opportunity to develop the characters, to define their world, and to determine their outcome. That's what the author does. Listen, God is the author of creation. And so He determines how that plays out. He's the author of this world. And He lovingly allows us to be a prominent part of His perfect plan. And the implications of that then are that He knows how I should live. 
He knows what's best for me today, tomorrow, next week. That He understands all of uh, the things that I'm going through. He determines the why of my life. God has a plan that's being unfolded in this world. One last thing, though. If I'm going to know uh, that God is always there, it means personally that I am always in His hands. And just as Moses reminded the Israelites, we have to be reminded that our eternal God sees our lives in an instance. He knows where you've been. He knows what's happening in your today. And He knows what's coming in your tomorrow. There's no possibility that He's going to be caught off guard or lacking in ability to handle it. That's why we're so comforted by the words that are... Uh, uh, recorded in Hebrews 13, 5, that God Himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. You know what? It means a lot when somebody else in our lives says that to us, doesn't it? Pam, hey, I'm going to be here with you throughout. And we appreciate that. And it gives us encouragement to know that other people are standing beside us. But how much more encouragement should it bring to us to know that the God of all eternity has said, I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to abandon you or forsake you in any way. I'm here. Your life is in my hands. Think of the impact of God saying never. I will never desert you or forsake you. For God to say never. For us to really understand that, we have to understand what it means when we say never. We mean by that... In most cases, barring unforeseen issues, as long as things don't change and until I'm worn down, I'm going to be there for you. When God says never, there is no chance regardless of anything. The circumstances don't matter. So to understand this and to process this personally, we have to acknowledge that yes, we're going to get weak. Yes, we'll be tired. Uh, yes, we'll experience pain. Yes, we're going to battle to do what's right in, in a fallen world. And we're going to face a lot of sorrows. We're also going to have some great days and some mountaintop experiences and some joys that characterize our lives. And we're going to celebrate in all those things. But whether it's a good day or a bad day, we need to remember who is guiding us through I came across this great statement. Uh, A.W. Pink is one of those Bible scholars from years gone by, and he made a great statement about this. And, and I couldn't say it any better, and I don't do this a lot, but I thought it was such a great statement I wanted to share it with you. He said, Here then is a rock on which we may fix our feet. While the mighty torrent is sweeping away everything around us, the permanence of God's character guarantees the fulfillment of His promises. That's said pretty well, isn't it? The permanence of God's character guarantees the fulfillment of His promises. The fact that God is an eternal God means every promise that He made throughout all of Scripture is guaranteed. All of it. It is all a guarantee from Him. All of God's attributes, His love, His mercy, His sovereignty, His grace, His forgiveness, His justice, His holiness, His righteousness, all of that is eternal because that's who God is. All of that is from everlasting to everlasting and He will never cease to provide all that we need to bring us to Himself. When Jesus said, in this world, you will have difficulty, he added, but take courage. I have overcome the world. It's the reminder that yet again, listen, yes, in this moment, and in your limited, in my limited understanding of time, and in what I'm facing, and how painful it is, yes, it's difficult. Yes, it's overwhelming. Yes, it's discouraging. Yes, it creates depression. Yes, it causes us to feel alone and isolated and beaten down. But God doesn't see it as we see it. 
he says, take courage. I've overcome all of that. The worst thing we can do in the face of difficulty and uncertainty and adversity and all the, the junk that this world throws at us, the worst thing we can do is become so obsessed in the moment that we miss the picture of who God is and what He's doing. But you know what? It's the nature of that stuff, isn't it? To blind us to the reality. To cause us to simply forget about God. To forget that He's there. And again, I'll go back to Nehemiah chapter 9. All the times that God raised the people up when they cried out to Him in repentance and God restored them, there came a time where they forgot about God. And the downward spiral began again. Until they hit that point where they said, God, you've got to help us. And they cried out to God. And God, through the prophets or through their leaders, would say to them, hey, repent, and God will restore you. And the people would repent, and God was there to lift them up. Listen, you may feel this morning as though you are at that low point, that God doesn't care, that nobody is there, that you are in the pit of misery and despair today. And if all you do is dwell in that place and look around at that, you're missing the most important part, that God can get you out of that. God stands above that. And He can rescue you and restore you, give you back hope and joy and peace and confidence moving forward. You say, how is that possible? Because God's already there. He's already in your tomorrow, in your next month, in your next year. And, you know, as we get older, we begin to think about things like, well, I don't have a lot of tomorrows. Or my number of tomorrows is smaller than it's ever been. Well, that's true for all of us. But you know what? When our time here is done, God is already preparing for what's after it. We can trust Him. What does Psalm 90 say? Lord, You have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were born, or You gave birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, You are God. If you don't remember anything that I say this morning, I hope you will remember what God's Word says. From everlasting to everlasting, He's God. I'm going to ask you to bow with me this morning.